Om Namo Bhagavate Sri Ramanaya. Let's dive deep into Sri Bhagavan's instruction. We'll take up in dialogue 389. Parkway through. Swami Lokeshananda, a sannyasi, asked, What is meant by jnana and vijnana? Sri Bhagavan replies, These words may mean differently according to the context. Jnana equals samanya jnana, or pure consciousness. Vijnana equals Vishesha jnana. Vishesha may be one worldly relative knowledge or secondly transcendental self-realization. The mind is necessary for Vishesha. It modifies the purity of absolute consciousness. So vijnana represents intellect and the sheath composing it, that is relative knowledge. In that case, jnana is common, samanya, running through vijnana, samjnana, anjnana, ajnana, mati, driti, different modes of knowledge. Or jnana is paroksha, hearsay, and vijnana is aparoksha, direct perception, as in jnana, vijnana, trip, tripatma one perfectly content with jnana and vijnana. The disciple asks, what is the relation between Brahman and Ishwara? Sri Bhagavan replies, Brahman is called Ishwara in relation to the world. The disciple asks, is it possible to speak to Ishwara as Sri Ramakrishna did? Sri Bhagavan replies, When we can speak to each other, why should we not speak to Ishwara in the same way? 
the disciple then said, and why does it not happen with us? Sri Bhagavan responds, it requires purity and strength of mind and practice in meditation. The disciple asked, does God become evident if the above conditions exist? Sri Bhagavan replies, such manifestation is as real as your own reality. In other words, when you identify yourself with the body, as in Jagrat, you see gross objects. When in a subtle body, or in a mental plane, as in Svapna, you see objects equally subtle. In the absence of identification, as in Sushupti, you see nothing. The objects seem <clears throat> to bear a relation to the state of the seer. The same applies to visions of God. By long practice, the figure of God as meditated upon appears in a dream and may later appear in Jagrat also. The disciple asks, is that the state of self-realization? Sri Bhagavan replied, listen to what happened some years ago. going to recount the story of Namdev, but let's consider what he said so far in greater detail. We speak of knowledge. What is knowledge? The opening paragraph of his answer spoke of different kinds of knowledge with, albeit, an abundance of Sanskrit terms. What is meant by knowledge? When you know something, what is that knowledge? When you know without a thing, what is that knowledge?
in the continuous knowledge of your existence, what is that? His answer refers to a passage in Aitareya Upanishad, speaking of knowledge. It is this heart or intellect and this mind. It is sentience, rulership, we could translate that as perception. Secular knowledge, presence of mind, retentiveness, sense perception, fortitude, thinking, genius, mental suffering, memory, ascertainment, resolution, life activities, hankering, passion, and such others. All these verily are the names of consciousness. Our own consciousness, which is innate, shines in manifold ways. To know the forms of such is to be caught up in the merely imagined or delusion. To know its essence is the realization of pure consciousness. Pure consciousness is samanya, universal. and runs through all the different modes of knowledge. Pure consciousness is direct perception, requiring neither the senses nor mental activity in order to know itself. In self-knowledge, what is known and what is the knower? In self-knowledge, there is no such distinction as known and knower. Consciousness is self-luminous. It knows itself by its own light. You should know that consciousness as your very existence. He says, the mind is necessary for vishesha. Vishesha means particularized, special. A mind is necessary for particularized knowledge. Seek the nature of the mind and what do you find? Negate the objectified aspect of your mind and what remains of it. 
Something still is, something still knows, but it is not a mind. It is only consciousness. And all the forms of the mind mentioned in the Upanishad, all of them are transient. One thing is before, in the midst of, and after them all. That is only consciousness. And consciousness, which is itself supreme knowledge of Prajnana, is Brahman as stated by the Mahavakya. The disciple then asked, what is the relation between Brahman and Ishwara, the Lord? And Bhagavan had replied, Brahman is called Ishwara, Brahman is called God in relation to the world. In relation to the world, the Absolute Brahman appears as the Lord. And similarly, the One Real Self appears as if individualized. Not considered in relation to anything, but known in truth as it is, Brahman is just Brahman. And the self is just the self. And the self and Brahman are identical, one and the same thing. As Shandogya Upanishad proclaims, Tatvamasi, that you are. The disciple had then asked, is it possible to speak to God, Ishwara, as Sri Ramakrishna did? Sri Bhagavan replies, when we can speak to each other, why should we not speak to Ishwara in the same way? The next question was, and why does it not happen with us? Sri Bhagavan replies, it requires purity and strength of mind and practice in meditation. Thereupon the next question was, does God become evident if the above conditions exist? That is, if there's purity and strength of mind, freedom from unwanted thoughts, and practice in meditation. The kind of meditation here is not explicitly stated. Sri Bhagavan then explains, such manifestation is as real as your own reality. Are you real?
In other words, when you identify yourself with the body as in Jagrat, waking state, you see gross objects. When in a subtle body or in a mental plane, as in Swapna and dream, you see objects equally subtle. In the absence of identification as in Sushupti, deep dreamless sleep, you see nothing. The objects seen bear a relation to the state of the seer. The same applies to visions of God. So the object always corresponds to the subject. You are the subject. The entire sphere of experience, gross and subtle, is the object. So if you misidentify yourself as a body, you think that a world appears and you perceive God accordingly, in accordance with that definition. If you misidentify with what is subtle, as in a dream state, then a dream world appears and God appears to manifest in a dreamlike way such as a vision. In deep dreamless sleep, there's no misidentification with the body or with the mind. Nothing is seen, but you still exist, and you know that you exist. What kind of knowledge is this that does not depend on perception or conception? What is this existence that is not gross, not subtle? The you that still exists in deep dreamless sleep is the same self that exists now. What has been added to it, such as only imagined? What is the nature of your existence? If this is known, God is known. Who knows God? Only God. Only Brahman can know Brahman. Another cannot do so. Likewise, only the self can know itself. The imagined individual cannot do so, for he is unreal. The unreal cannot know the real. The real knows the real, but not objectively. To really see God make your vision non-objective. And inquiring, who am I? God knows God. The Maharshi completed his answer by saying, By long practice, the figure of God is meditated upon, appears in dream, and may later appear in Jagrat also, in other words, in waking state. But what is it that we wish to realize? A vision that's not eternal? The eternal alone is worth seeking. That which is eternal is unborn and indestructible. It is never a known object. It is never an unknown object. (laughs) 
know your existence as it is, and you found the eternal, for existence never ceases to exist. Only do not confuse it with name and form, the conceived and the perceived. The disciple then asked, is that the state of God-realization? And Bhagavan responded, listen to what happened once years ago. There was a saint by name Namdev. He could see, talk, and play with Vitoba, named for God, as we do with one another. He used, he used to spend most of his time in the temple playing with Vitoba. On one occasion, the saints had assembled together, among whom was one Yanadev of well-established fame and eminence. Yanadev asked Gora Kumbar, the potter saint, to use his proficiency in testing the soundness of baked pots and find out which of the assembled saints was properly baked clay. So Gora Kumbar took his stick and gently struck each one's head in joke as if to test. When he came to Namdev, the latter protested in a huff. All laughed and hooted. Namdev was enraged, and he sought Vitoba in the temple. Vitoba said that the saints knew best. This unexpected reply upset Namdev all the more. He said, You are God. I converse and play with you. Can there be anything more to be gained by man? Vitova persisted, the saints know. Namdev said, tell me if there is anything more real than you. <clears throat> Vitova replied, we have been so familiar with each other that my advice will not have the desired effect on you. Seek the beggar saint in the forest and know the truth. Accordingly, Namdev sought out the particular saint mentioned by Vithova. Namdev was not impressed with the holiness of the man, for he was nude, dirty, and was lying on the floor with his feet resting on a lingam. Namdev wondered how this could be a saint. The saint, on the other hand, smiled on Namdev and asked, Did Vithova send you here? This was a great surprise to Namdev who is now more inclined to believe the man to be great. So Namdev asked him, You are said to be a saint. Why do you desecrate the lingam? The saint replied, Indeed, I am too old and weak to do the right thing. Please lift my feet and place them where there is no lingam. Namdev accordingly lifted the saint's feet and placed them elsewhere. But there was again a lingam below them. Wherever the feet were placed, then and there appeared a linga underneath. Namdev finally placed the feet on himself, and he turned into a linga. Then Namdev understood that God was imminent, and learnt the truth and departed. He went home and did not go to the temple for several days. Vithoba now sought him out in his home, and asked why Namdev would not go to the temple to see God. Namdev said, is there a place where he is not? The moral of the story is clear. Visions of God have their place below the plane of self-realization. Self-realization is found in the knowledge of identity.
visions and similar kinds of experience are not to be equated with self-realization. And self-realization alone is eternal. A disciple asked, When I read Sri Bhagavan's works, I find that investigation is said to be the one method for realization. Sri Bhagavan replied, Yes, that is vichara, inquiry. The disciple asked, How is that to be done? Sri Bhagavan replied, the questioner must admit the existence of his self. I am is the realization. To pursue the clue until realization is vichara, inquiry. Vichara and realization are the same. The disciple said, It is elusive. What shall I meditate upon? Sri Bhagavan replied, Meditation requires an object to meditate upon, whereas there is only the subject without the object in vichara. Meditation differs from vichara in this way. The disciple asked, Is not dhyana, meditation, one of the efficient processes for realization? The Maharshi explains some more. Dhyana is concentration on an object. It fulfills the purpose of keeping away diverse thoughts and fixing the mind on a single thought, which must also disappear before realization. But realization is nothing new to be acquired. It is already there, but obstructed by a screen of thoughts. All our attempts are directed, to, directed for lifting this screen, and then realization is revealed. If a true seeker is advised to meditate, many may go away satisfied with the advice. But someone among them may turn around and ask, Who am I to meditate on an object? Such a one must be told that to find the self. That is the finality. That is vijara. The disciple asks, Will vichara alone do in the absence of meditation? Sri Bhagavan replies, Vichara is the process and the goal also. I am is the goal and the final reality. To hold to it with effort is vichara. When spontaneous and natural, it is realization. The first question was, the seeker was finding that investigation is said to be the one method for realization in Bhagavan's teachings. The Maharshi had replied, yes, that is vichara, that is inquiry. Why is inquiry recommended as the one method for realization? Because it alone does not assume the dualisms that one is trying to transcend. What could be more direct than inquiry to know the self in order to reach self-knowledge? Self-knowledge alone is self-realization. How is that to be done, was the next question. The Maharshi explained, The questioner must admit the existence of his self. You exist. 
and you know you exist. How do you know it? It is with a knowledge that is doubtless. You never doubt your own existence. You may have a doubt about anything else, but existence is certain. From where comes such certitude? The questioner must admit the existence of his self. I am, that is just existence, is the realization. Being, only being, in which being is knowing, is the realization. The realization is not an occurrence, nor is it a condition or an attribute of something else. To be non-dual and thus to be eternal, the realization must be of a nature that is identical with that which is realized. So what is your existence? Who am I? To pursue the clue, your sense of existence, until realization is inquiry. Inquiry which are, and realization are the same. The end itself appears as the means. We'll take up the rest of the dialogue next time. Om Namo Bhagavate Sri Ramanaya.